Today we're going to be taking a look at Land Rover's newest vehicle, the all-new Defender. And you're also going to be getting a little bit of a window inside my daily life. You see, I do live out here in the country. I live out in the Redwood Forest in Northern California. And we've had a severe windstorm and then a severe wind and rainstorm back to back. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about the Defender and putting it through its paces as I try and re-clear some of the trails that I use for vehicle testing around here. In theory, the Defender is exactly the kind of vehicle for me. I live off the beaten path. We could be without power for days out here in the Redwood Forest. This has a great look to it, a luxurious interior, a nice ride, and a lot of off-road capability. If you've been a subscriber for any length of time, you've probably seen a lot of random things lurking around in the videos, like my home-built fuel trailer, my lightly lifted Grand Cherokee with some body damage when a tree hit it in a winter storm, a 14-foot box trailer, which is, I think, the handiest kind of trailer anybody out there can own, a 26-foot tilt bed flatbed trailer for when and the box trailer just isn't enough trailer. And then the sort of things you end up with in rural living. Between my neighbor and myself, we have an excavator, a dumper with tracks. We also have a diesel chipper and a lot of other random tools and things that need to be hauled around. With that out of the way and the randomness of mountain life on full display, let's dive back into the Defender. I have to say, I love the look. This definitely looks like a concept car to me, with the exception perhaps of the fact that these headlights are a little bit recessed rather than being flush mount. Everything about this really looks like some of those cars that are never destined to make it to production, except that Land Rover decided to do that with the Defender. We have full LED headlights up front, fog lights down below, front parking sensors well integrated into the front bumper, a fairly discreet Land Rover logo on this side, and then Defender printed out in very large type. In case you're wondering, the bottom of the bumper is all plastic. So this black egg crate section right here where we have the forward-looking camera, this is plastic. This silver section is plastic as well, as is this lower portion here. But there are skid plates in the Defender, as you'd expect out of a rugged off-road vehicle, and the bottom of the Defender is almost entirely flat to help keep this from getting caught on branches, brush, that sort of thing. That's really helpful out in the forest, I have to say, because one thing that I've noticed with other off-road vehicles even the ones with skid plates, is that branches and twigs can get caught in strange places under there and then you end up dragging them along for a while and that's kind of annoying. Obviously there are still going to be openings under here. If we go in for a closer look you'll notice that we have uh, some openings right there by those skid plates between those and the sides of the vehicle, but everything definitely is tucked up very nicely under the body. Speaking of the body, the Defender is a unibody SUV. So in terms of design, this is actually more similar to something like the Jeep Grand Cherokee than the Jeep Wrangler. This also has a full four-corner independent suspension and an available air suspension like we find in that Grand Cherokee. In terms of length, this four-door model is about two inches shorter than the Jeep, as long as we're not talking about that spare tire on the rear door. Now there is a two-door Defender available, and for 2021, that two-door Defender is available in more trim levels than it was last year. Competition for the Defender is a little bit tricky to talk about. Logically, you could cross shop this against something like the new Ford Bronco or a Jeep Wrangler and look at this as a luxury upgrade from some of those options. But again, in terms of general theme, this is a little bit closer to the Grand Cherokee in terms of its structural design. And we are gonna be getting an all new Grand Cherokee sometime later in 2021. You could also compare this to some of those rugged body on frame SUVs out there like the uh, Nissan Armada. You could also take a look at something like the Lexus LX, which is gonna be about the same same size as this, the Armada is a little bit longer, or any of the host of international body on frame SUVs, like of course that Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. But this is going to be a lot less expensive than the G-Wagon. Price-wise, this is actually within the envelope of the Jeep Grand Cherokee. If you want the base Defender, that's going to start just over $46,000, and it's one of the few vehicles from the factory that's available with steel wheels, and that's because Land Rover really would like you to take this off-road. In a departure from most luxury crossovers, we have a very vertical rear end, and that makes us an awful lot more cargo practical than those raked forward designs that you find in the rest of the Land Rover lineup. The thing that looks most like a concept car to me are these tail lamps. I have to say these are really cool, although they do look pretty hard to clean because of all the nooks and crannies and recesses in these little square modules. They definitely have a great look to them. I'm also not the biggest fan of a spare tire on the rear door, although there's a logical reason for that. That means that the spare tire doesn't take up cargo room in the back or underneath the vehicle so that helps improve your departure angles and uh, of course it allows you to install a full-size spare tire right like the one that we have on this model. The door is hinged on the right side of the rear and if we open this up you'll notice that we have a pretty decently sized cargo area and again very very square. Since this model has the optional adaptive air suspension I can press a button right here to lower the air suspension in the rear. That makes loading cargo a lot easier than if the suspension was at its highest height and then you can also raise it back if for some reason you wanted to do that right from here. A 120 volt power outlet over here on the right side but only 180 watts. I do wish that was a higher power inverter. 
There are three different cargo capacity numbers that are important. Behind the third row, which is available in this four-door version, you'll get 10.7 cubic feet, but it is a pretty tiny cargo area. One nice touch is that on the rubber cargo mat, we do have this fold-out flap, so that way you can keep from scratching up portions of the bumper, keep them a little bit neater and tidier. This model, which is the four-door Defender without the third row, has 36.2 cubic feet of storage space back here. And if you get the 90 version, which is the short wheelbase two-door version, then you'll find 15.6 cubic feet of storage space behind the seats. Uh, one thing that I found odd is this cargo cover. It is not a roller-style cargo cover, and it's not one of those ones with the metal hoops inside. Instead, it has two bars, one on each side with some little rubbery clips there, and then a tab over here, and they slotting into some slots and tabs on the side. I found this an awful lot uh, more difficult to use than some of those roller style cargo covers. So I suspect most people are probably just gonna leave this off the vehicle. On the other hand, this is an awful lot easier to store because you can just sort of crunch it up and then drop it right back here into any of those storage compartments. With that out of the way, it's time to load up and then get out on the trail. Obviously we need to toss our PPP in here helmet, ear protection, and then a, uh, a selection of saws. This is one of my favorite saws. This is a uh, 357 with a 24 inch bar. Definitely need that one. This is my new all time favorite, a uh, new small one with a 16 inch bar. And then uh, it's always good to have a saw and a spare. And then it's always good to have a, a spare for the spare just in case something goes a little wrong. So we'll just uh, toss that little guy in there, some extra fuel, and then uh, let's get out on the trail. Some folks were a little bit upset that this new Defender not only is a unibody vehicle, but it doesn't have solid axles. But there's a logical reason for that. As long as you're not planning on lifting the vehicle aftermarket, that is a bit trickier with a suspension and body design like this, then there are some definite benefits. Because having a fully independent suspension means that when the air suspension is driving those wheels down and the body up, you've created sort of a little triangle under the vehicle. So you've increased the ground clearance between the bulk of the vehicle all the way out there towards some of those suspension components that are angling back towards the ground. That makes things different than a solid axle vehicle where the only real way to increase total ground clearance is simply to put bigger tires and wheels on the vehicle because the clearance to the axle is gonna be a big factor. The other thing that's a little bit different than some of the competition is we don't have a front locker in the Defender. We do have an electronic rear locker that will operate as either a limited slip or a full locking differential, but traction across the front axle is simply done by bandaging the brakes on the left and the right to send power wherever you want it to go. That gives the vehicle a little bit more flexibility than a traditional simple on-off locker, but I have to say I really wish this did have a full mechanical locker. Now that we've reached the first obstacle, it's time to uh, continue the talk outside. One tree down, now let's see what awaits us. So again, there are logical reasons to not have a true locking front differential. Obviously, it's gonna save weight. Something like this is lighter than a traditional locking differential or the electronic differential that we have in the rear. But I have to say, I really wish Land Rover would have given us something like the rear differential up front. Because the rear differential will not only work as a limited slip differential if it needs to, but it can also fully lock. You can command it through this infotainment system, and that's really a handy feature. Now let's tackle the tricky subject of reliability. I know that a lot of folks have written in over at our Facebook page asking about TFL's experience with their Defender. I'm actually pretty good friends with Roman Micah, so I've heard all of the tales before they even went on video. And yes, I will admit that that definitely is a bit of a concern for a vehicle like this Land Rover. That logically is also a bit of a concern for a vehicle like a Jeep. 
they generally speaking haven't been as reliable as some of the Toyota options. So this versus something like a Lexus GX or a Lexus LX, you should expect this to be a little bit less reliable. How much less reliable? That's something that we honestly won't know until production has lasted a little bit longer in the Defender. Because this vehicle has only been on sale and in production for a short period of time, so it simply could have been an initial problem that Land Rover has since rectified. I was a little bit worried about this door. It is pretty heavy in the rear, but when it's fully open, it will stay open on some pretty steep slopes. start talking about some of the numbers. Zero to 60 happened in this model in six and a half seconds. That's right around what Jaguar Land Rover says this should do. If you get the lightest version of the Defender with the turbocharged six cylinder engine, then theoretically it could go zero to 60 in 5.8 seconds. But the model that I'm driving is the four door version that has a lot of options on it. So this is a little bit heavier, right around 5,700 pounds. In my braking testing, it took 132 feet to stop this vehicle from 60 miles an hour. That's a little bit longer than something like an X5 or a GLE, but remember that this has much more of an off-road mission in mind. So we have those more off-road oriented tires, and that's gonna make a big difference in terms of stopping distance. The Defender's ground clearance varies based on whether you get the short wheelbase version, the long wheelbase version, or whether you get the model with adaptive air suspension or the regular steel spring suspension. It comes in at a low of 8.6 inches for the long wheelbase model without the adaptive suspension system and 11.5 for both models with the air suspension. Although logically, the breakover angle is going to be better in the short wheelbase version because the wheels are closer together, that's gonna give you the best off-roading angles. One thing I've definitely noticed out on the trail, especially when stopping like this when the vehicle is at an angle, is that the rear air suspension will start load leveling once the vehicle is off. So if you're out on a more rugged trail and you found yourself up against an obstacle, obviously something larger than this tree stump right here, and you decide to stop the car and turn it off, you may wanna really think about turning the vehicle off because that rear suspension may end up dropping down and then hitting whatever obstacle you're nearby. Internationally, Land Rover has a number of different engines available in the Defender, but in the US, there are just two. There's a base four-cylinder turbocharged engine. It's a two-liter engine producing 296 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque. Then we get this engine right here. It's the most interesting one. It's an all-new three-liter inline six engine. Same displacement and same cylinder arrangement that we find in BMWs and, of course, modern Mercedes as well. This engine produces 395 horsepower and 406 pound-feet of torque, and very much like the Mercedes EQ series, of engines, this is a mild hybrid. It has a 48 volt electric motor on one end of the engine, it produces about 10 horsepower and about 50 pound feet of torque. That is less power and less torque than we find in the Mercedes EQ line of engines, but it operates in very much the same way. That's one of the reasons that this Defender, even with its two speed transfer case, the effective low ratio, the all season tires, etc., gets 18 miles per gallon combined. Interestingly enough, this engine is quite efficient. So even though this has more power than we find in the two liter four cylinder engine, the fuel economy is essentially the same in most trims. For the Defender that I'm driving today, there's only a one mile per gallon penalty in the combined score for getting the six cylinder over the four cylinder. If I were buying a Defender, I would probably get pretty close to the model that I'm driving today. This one came in at $72,000. So that is an awful lot more expensive than the base model. Definitely keep that in mind. But I love the way the six cylinder engine feels out on the road. It has gobs of power, an awful lot of torque, and it really feels like a more powerful engine than the numbers would otherwise indicate, or even that zero to 60 time. The massive amount of low-end torque that we get out of this engine is really great off-roading as well. i found that for a lot of the maneuvers out here on this narrow road and some of the steeper sections, etc., that I haven't needed four low at all. I've been able to do it all just in regular four high. 
I know a lot of folks prefer body on frame vehicles for more rugged off-roading duty, but I have to say I've always had a soft spot for vehicles exactly like this and the Grand Cherokee and the rest of the Range Rover lineup, because this is very civilized on-road and off-road. To be honest, I was not expecting the Defender to be as civilized as it really is. One of the things that I really love about this vehicle is the way the air suspension operates. One of the things that you'll notice in some of the earlier generations of adaptive height suspensions like this, especially in vehicles like a Jeep Grand Cherokee, is that when they're at their maximum height, the ride ends up being pretty rough. With an independent suspension like this, you can think of it as if the wheels and axles were sort of an arm that met somewhere inboard of the vehicle. And if you want to increase your ride height, you push that wheel down, lifting the body up, but that means that you are at the bottom of the suspension travel, or at the top of the suspension travel, depending on how you want to look at it. Either way, there's not a lot of travel left. To help minimize some of the bounce tendencies that we see in vehicles, for instance, like the Jeep Grand Cherokee, they've altered the way the suspension behaves. So obviously there's more suspension travel than we find in that Jeep, just generally available in this design, but they've also cross-linked the air suspension from one side of the vehicle to the other. The mission is to improve traction and make sure that all four tires have contact with the ground. So if this side is really compressed, it's actually going to push the other wheel on the other side of the vehicle down to help interact with the road surface or gravel surface a little bit better. The definite advantage to the design of the Defender is that this has great on-road driving dynamics while also giving you a very comfortable ride off-road. And that's thanks to the air suspension as much to the body and general suspension design of the Defender. This is definitely the kind of vehicle you want to be in if you're spending a lot of time out on rougher roads like the road that I'm on here. If this is part of your daily commute, then something like this Defender is going to be absolutely excellent. I also love the full-time all-wheel drive system or four-wheel drive system, whatever you want to call it. I love the fact that it is completely automatic. We don't have a part-time transfer case because out on road surfaces like this, a full-time all-wheel drive system is definitely a little bit more convenient. You have the traction when you need it, you can lock it when you need it, but you don't have that same sort of binding and tearing up of a private road or private trail or your own driveway that you can get with a part-time four-wheel drive system. Remember that if you lock the center coupling and you lock the differentials in an off-road vehicle like a Jeep Wrangler or something along those lines, then the wheels are all turning at the same rate. And that's not what you want if you need to turn in tight circles. So out on road surfaces like this, those kinds of setups can actually tear up the road surface a bit more, cause greater wear out on private roads or private trails. That's definitely a consideration. I also really love a full-time all-wheel drive system like this when towing a trailer because it just gives you more traction, especially out on gravel roads. I'm actually towing trailers out on roads like this quite frequently, and having that extra traction to get you up and over the hill is definitely a benefit. Now, when it comes to absolute handling scores, obviously the off-road mission of this is gonna compete with the on-road handling mission in most SUVs and crossovers out there. So when it comes to on-road handling, I'm gonna give this a B. You will certainly find vehicles that are a bit more engaging to drive, but when it comes to ride quality, I'm gonna give this an A+, on-road or off-road. Speaking of off-roading, I love the customized drive program right there in the center console, because otherwise I think that the throttle pedal is just a little bit too aggressive, a little bit too touchy, and it's too easy to have an exaggerated throttle input, but you can dial it down in that custom mode if you want to, and uh, you definitely get a better feel for off-roading. Bearing in mind that this vehicle wears a luxury brand logo on the front end, I'm gonna give these seats eight out of 10 points when it comes to front seat comfort. We do have a four-way adjustable lumbar support and a three-position memory over there on the door, a powered tilt telescopic steering column. The control is on the opposite side from normal because of course in Britain, the steering wheel is on the opposite side from normal. But at least for my body shape, I found these seats to be very, very comfortable. In this version, they are heated as well. The Defender is not a small vehicle on the outside, and very much like the Lexus GX and the Jeep Grand Cherokee, because of the off-road mission and the desire to have that long hood so you can put longer engines under there, the interior is not going to be as space efficient as some of those more on-road focused crossovers like a Lexus RX or something like that. But there's still a lot of room back here. I have about six inches of legroom with the front seat comfortably adjusted for me. And the one thing you'll really notice about the Defender is how wide the cabin is. That's because the Defender itself is a pretty wide vehicle. The interior is not quite as wide as some of the full-size SUVs available in America or an F-150, but it's actually pretty close. That means that most folks shouldn't have a problem putting three adults across the rear. So nice touches back here are some tablet holders right here integrated into the rear seat back. There's also a USB charge port there and then charge ports in the center console as well. I like that there's so many storage areas in the Defender. We have some storage areas right back here, one for your warning triangle right there in the rear door. There's some little pockets on the side of the cargo area. 
and the rear seats are a 40-20-40 folding design. This seat design requires that you flip the bottom part of the seat forward first, that's not my favorite, but the seat backs in the second row have this tough plastic texture to them, so that way it really is going to wear well if you're putting a lot of really sharp things or rough things back here, like of course the trio of chainsaws. In my cabin noise testing at 50 miles an hour, I got 70 decibels in here, making this a little bit louder than something like the BMW X5, but surprisingly quiet for a unibody SUV. Generally speaking, body on frame SUVs are a little bit quieter than this because there's a bit more isolation between the parts that are contacting the road and the cabin, but this is definitely very quiet, very suitable for the luxury segment. Fuel economy has been a little bit difficult to divine because I haven't had that much time with the Defender, and of course I've been driving it on more rugged trails like this the entire time I've had it, but I definitely think that 18 miles per gallon on average is achievable if you're nice to the engine. This six cylinder drivetrain employs a mild hybrid system, very similar to what we see in the Mercedes lineup, and that definitely has an impact on fuel economy. The engine start stop is definitely smoother than we find in previous generations of Jaguar products or Land Rover products that have had that particular function. Although this is not a full hybrid, so it's not gonna give you as much of a fuel economy improvement as you would find in a full hybrid system in some of the other options out there. As you'd logically expect, on-road or off-road, this is the perfect British alternative to something like the Jeep Grand Cherokee or some of those larger and more capable off-road vehicles. But I honestly really think that that Grand Cherokee corollary is a little bit more appropriate than trying to compare this to a Jeep Wrangler. Now let's take a quick spin around the interior. This model has a panoramic moonroof. You can see it extends to just about the rear passenger's lap area, not really their heads, but we have a very distinctive Landover feature, which are these windows right there above the second row area and a little bit above where the third row would be if you chose that particular option. The driver and front passenger have fixed height shoulder belts. I do wish these were adjustable. The front seats are a combination of fabric and leather. You can see we have fabric on the outside there, leather in the middle. And then moving over to the front doors, we have a touch that we see in some other modern off-road vehicles where you can actually see some of the body painted metal right there. So this sort of uh, olive drab area right there, that's actually metal matching the body paint on the outside. We then have a lot of soft touch materials as you'd expect in a luxury vehicle up top, etc some visible screw heads right there giving this a little bit more of a rugged theme. It's kind of funny how visible screw heads have come back after being banished for so long as being just definitely not modern or luxurious. We have a large storage bin down there at the bottom and this has one of the available Meridian audio systems. Moving on over to the dashboard, the distinctive and rugged theme continues. We have Devender printed right there on that plastic section. We have stitched materials going on above and below. These are rails that run across the dashboard and there's a storage area that actually runs completely across the dash behind this infotainment system right there, all the way across to the driver's side. And then there's even a small storage cubby over there on the other side of the steering wheel. We have two large air vents up top. I do wish they were placed a little bit lower in the dash. I found those a little bit high. And then we have Jaguar Land Rover's latest infotainment software. This is significantly faster than the software that we find in some of their older vehicles. As you'd expect, the system supports smartphone integration, and it uses almost the entire screen. The left side and the right side of the screens are reserved for system functions. So we have a home button over here, direct access back to that CarPlay very easily. In addition to the typical 360 degree camera readings where you can pick a specific camera with the software or view wide angle views, that sort of thing, you can also see augmented reality views. So you can click around those three quadrants there or use these arrow buttons to rotate the vehicle around. That's the on-road setting. There's also an off-road setting here that gives you some information about the locking differential in the center and in the rear. You can also engage a towing view so you can see what's going on behind you. As you'd expect in an off-road oriented vehicle, there are a ton of different screens in here for the off-road system. You can see altitude, inclination, the status of the suspension system. You can see where all the wheels are positioned there. It has a wade sensor, which will tell you whether it detects that you're wading through water. You can get trail information right there of your different trail modes, and you can configure the trail mode, which is really a handy touch. So if, for instance, I would prefer my center and rear slip to be limited, my powertrain to be relaxed so it's not too jumpy, I prefer heavy steering, generally speaking, and then a little bit more wheel spin allowed by the software, that is all configurable right within here. Or of course, you could go with any of the vehicle's standard modes. You can see all those scrolling down there across the bottom. We have things like comfort, gravel, grass, snow, mud rut, sand, rock crawling, that sort of thing. Or of course, you can just leave it in auto. Below the LCD, we have a joystick style shifter, engine start stop button there, the controls for the climate control and the air suspension. You can see the air suspension controls are over here on this side, raise it, lower it, and that's the progress control. We have the two speed transfer case control right there. 
auto start stop off. This one has a front defroster in addition to a rear defroster and a front defogger. And then these buttons control what these two knobs do. So this one will now control the terrain response system right there, or I could snap it back to the climate control zone. And then if I click this button, this one will become the fan control. Moving down from there, we have some USB inputs, charge ports, a lot of open-ended storage. You can definitely see that's a nice deep storage well. I have my iPhone deep down in there. We have a cup holder, wireless charging mat, and then a pretty decently sized center cubby. This one looks to be nicely insulated and uh, it has a little rubber seal here on top, which is kind of an interesting touch. And then it is upholstered in fabric matching the seats. I was a little bit concerned about the visible screws on the center console. You can see that we have several of them here down the center console. Now for me, when I'm driving the vehicle, my knee doesn't bump on those, but if you are shorter or taller than I am, you might end up with your knee rubbing on those and those might get a little bit uncomfortable after a while. From this angle, you can see that that large storage area also extends to just under the cup holders. Infotainment software may be new, but the instrument cluster software is basically the same as what we've seen in Jaguar and Land Rover products for a while. You can choose between a uh, two dial view with a information panel right there in the middle or a one dial view where you get information panels on either side. There's also a full map display, but this is never going to give you satellite imagery like you'd find in an Audi. There's a media centric display so you can see what your tunes are playing right there and then a driver assistance centric display as well. The driver assistance center display reminds me an awful lot of some modern Lincoln products and the fact that it definitely is really understated. The steering wheel is quite different from other Land Rover products. We have plastic spokes, a leather wrap, and then a plastic airbag cover there. And the plastic spokes match the plastics going around the interior. The buttons on the steering wheel are a combination of physical click and touch buttons. So this button bank clicks in and the system knows what button you press based on where you're touching the face of the wheel. When Land Rover first announced the towing capability of the Defender, I was honestly pretty shocked because the model that I'm driving today can go up to over 8,200 pounds of towing capacity, 8,201 to be exact. There aren't very many SUVs that will tow over 8,000 pounds. The numbers are incredibly small. You're basically looking at full-size SUVs, something along the lines of a Ford Expedition, or if you're looking at something slightly smaller than that, a Dodge Durango will tow up to 8,700 pounds, not too much more than this Defender, and it is a little bit longer. But basically nothing else in the same size class as the Defender will tow this kind of weight. So if you are looking to go a bit further off the beaten path and tow a big trailer while doing it, the Defender is going to be one of the few options available. Comparisons for the Defender can be a little bit tricky because there's not much like this in the American market right now. We of course have the Wrangler and the Bronco. I could see a lot of folks that are shopping those models and want something a little bit more luxurious would definitely gravitate towards the Defender, but they're not quite the same vehicle and the price range is definitely quite different. Again, this model came in at $72,000 and there are definitely more expensive options available. The Wrangler and the Bronco are not exactly cheap, but those two vehicles are targeted at a slightly different shopper. Of course, the Wrangler has an available front locker, it has solid axles, it's going to be a different flavor of off-roading than this vehicle. It has roof that comes off, the front window comes off, the doors come off, etc. It's just a different kind of off-road experience. This is definitely a little bit more civilized. And in that vein, this reminds me a little bit of the Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. But the G-Wagon is also that next level in off-roading ability with that true front locker, etc. And of course, this the history that we have in that G-Wagon. Unfortunately, I've only had a short amount of time with the Defender, only about 48 hours or so. This was a really short press loan. So hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on the two-door Defender with perhaps a four-cylinder engine at some point in the future. Be sure and stay tuned for that video. At the moment, I can easily say that the Defender is an awful lot of fun. And this is a great, great option for someone like me that lives out in the country and wants something that has a really capable all-wheel drive system, a lot of ground clearance, decent towing ability, over 7,000 pounds if you get it equipped as this particular model is, and if you want something that has an available teeny tiny third row, although it's not as practical as I would like. This is definitely going to be a little bit less practical in terms of third row accommodations to something like the upcoming Jeep Grand Cherokee L. One interesting thing in this segment is going to be the Grand Cherokee because the next generation Grand Cherokee is promising to be much more of a luxury oriented vehicle while still retaining a lot of its off-road ability or even improving on it according to FCA. And that's exactly what we see in the Defender. This is the kind of vehicle you want to go towards if you want the off-roading ability that you'd find in something like a Bronco or a mid-level Jeep Wrangler, but you want something with a luxury brand and of course something with the luxury trappings that we see in this model on the inside. 
You could also say that this is the vehicle for someone that wants to go off-roading but doesn't want to have to fiddle with mechanical off-road controls. Now, personally, I find some joy in pulling levers myself when I need to, but this system will do it all for you. It will lock and unlock the rear differential faster than you can with any of those controls, and it will also give you that limited slip functionality, which is really a handy feature. And of course, with the all-terrain drive modes, it's going to control traction across the front axle and between the front axle and the rear axle. On the downside, the Defender is not going to be quite as easy to modify aftermarket logically because of its independent suspension design versus something like the Wrangler or the Bronco. So if you really plan on doing an extensive lift with your vehicle, you're going to want to take a look at something with solid axles rather than something like this or a Land Rover Range Rover or, of course, a Jeep Grand Cherokee. The other logical reason to get the Defender is frankly the looks. I love the way this vehicle looks. We have these massive fender flares front and rear. It's big, it's boxy, it's wide, and it has that look of a concept car that I truly love. If my own money were on the line, would I buy a Defender? That one I'm not too sure on, primarily because of the tow ratings. This is rated to tow over 7,000 pounds. However, I really need to tow over 8,000 pounds. So this is close, but not quite where I would want it to be. And then of course there is the price tag. As equipped, and I would probably want one equipped like the model that I've been driving, this came in right over $72,000, so it is a little bit more expensive than vehicles that I'm looking at outside of this. But outside of the Durango and this Defender, there is nothing else approximately this size in a two-row or three-row SUV that will tow this kind of weight. So if you're looking to tow that larger trailer and you don't want a pickup truck, you want an off-road vehicle like the Defender, this is one of the few vehicles that could fit that particular need. Now for me, I I think that the price tag is just a little bit too high for my personal blood on the Defender, and that's why I ended up crossing it off of my shopping list. But let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below, and would you spend your hard-earned money on something like this Defender right here? I have to say I really like the P400 version in the four-door format, although I'm really eager to test drive the two-door version. Hopefully I'll be able to do that sometime soon. In the meantime, be sure and hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. You can also find me over at facebook.com slash alexnatos. Check out the merch store over there at aoamerch.com and I'll see all of you next week.